My name is Öste Holtan and I'm the founder of Studio Holtan. I think that my company stands for and works for site-specific architecture. Architecture that belongs to the site and that um, reflects the nature and the landscape. I think that uh, you know site-specific architecture is of course about the nature but it's also about you know you can have site-specific architecture in the city as well it's about reading the environment and making sure the architecture interacts with the environment uh, so it could be because I'm from Norway that I think about it in the terms of nature but it could also be in the city with urban environments At the moment I'm doing about four projects. One project is situated in Oslo, in the hillside with a view towards Oslo and the Oslo Fjord. The project is an extension to a villa uh, originally drawn by Lund Slotto, which is a Norwegian architect firm. The extension is proposing a new, new way of, of using um, a horizontal and vertical uh, proportions to the extension. And another project is a project in the southern part of Norway, um, situated in an old fishing village uh, on top of a cliff. And that is a residential building proposing new ways of, you know, living during the year. Another project is a treetop hotel uh, in a more rural part of Norway, where I'm working with you know, different cabins uh, that work together and the project is really about attracting tourists. And there's also some husky tours and stuff like that. So the project will be a bigger project with more smaller cabins and smaller projects in it. <laughs> I've always wanted to become an architect, and this is probably the most epic answer ever. Uh, but it's something about the creative side of it. And since I was little, I started drawing plan drawings and uh, facades and sections and such. And I think that was partly because I grew up in, um, in an old listed farm in Norway. <laughs> And you can imagine, you know, a building from the 1600s is not ideal for a family with uh, three very active kids. So I think from early on, I wanted to do changes and propose changes to my parents. You know, draw, draw sketches on how an extension would be, where the bathroom, new bathroom should be. And, and, then, um, and then I started watching Grand Designs, which is a BBC program. Uh, with a guy named Kevin McLeod uh, and from that moment that became my favorite program and what that really did it, it, it showed me how modern architecture can be situated together with old architecture in the city in the countryside it showed a little bit of the building process the design process and it really took took us through all these different uh, projects and that was a very big motivation and inspiration for me. Especially this uh, motivation and inspiration I got from watching uh, Grand Designs, for example, and looking up images in magazines and on the internet and talking about it, drawing, all those things. You know, it gives uh, some sort of internal glow and also a meaning with life. And I think that was, you know, when I could feel that internal glow it made me certain that this was very nice, you know, occupation. <laughs> when I was that young, I didn't know about all the tools you needed to learn, all the technical things you need to use. You know, it was just about this vision and this dream of creating something. But now I see that, of course, there's a lot of hard work and there's a lot of technical issues, a lot of problems, a lot of, you know, it's a process. I 
think uh, one of the biggest changes in my view is the way we work partly because of the technology you know the computer does a lot of the designing the computer does a lot of detailing and we use renderings instead of sketches and so on and so forth but also the way we look at cities and architecture and built environments now is more about designing strategies and designing concepts for urban planning uh, instead of just making you know an artistic project so it's more about using new types of architectural tools uh, in the process i think that's the biggest shift and also of course there's new materials there's a lot more focus on sustainability and all these things as well I have had good success with reaching out to people, you know, doing Google searches and find people on different platforms. And it could be uh, the equivalent to DBA, for example, in Norway it's called finn.no, where people post smaller jobs that they want somebody to do for them. Uh, and it's completely free. I found a couple of jobs there. Um, and actually the last one was the Treetop Hotel project that I found through a free platform uh, where a guy just wrote, I need an architect to design something special. And then, you know, I reached out and found out that he was actually from my area in Norway and then it created this good uh, connection. So I have a lot of good results with reaching out, but of course also uh, word of mouth is the way that you can get new clients and also through Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, and I also partly use a platform called Mit Anbud. It's for the building industry where you, you as an architect can make a profile and then you pay a little bit, you know, a certain amount each month and you can answer all these people that need your assistance. Word of mouth is a good way to get new projects, but it, you know, it depends on what you're after. Because if the if there's a lot of competition in one field of architecture, then maybe you should rethink your business and uh, think about how you can be unique and do something else. Because then you'll have a different platform. You have different customers. I think you can change your field, for example, through, you know, you have to go out after it um, because if you just lean back and you get new projects by word of mouth, you tend to get the same type of projects that you already had. And so if you just lean back and relax, then you will probably just do those same projects. But if you really want to do something else, else then you can, you know, sign up for a competition on something else, you can propose some new theories, you can write a book, you can, you can do all these things and you can also reach out to new customers to see if they want to hire you for this new type of project. So it really depends on your attitude as an office. If you want the customers to come to you or if you want to do, you know, play an active role and find those, you know, ideal projects. I think it's great, uh, a great way to um, propose new ideas, uh, new theories and new ways of, of looking at architecture because a lot of clients would not say yes to you know, those new ways of seeing architecture. So um, it's a good way, good way of introducing them in a project uh, to test them out, but maybe not all the time, but once in a while, yeah. It's hard for, especially hard for new companies 
to get new customers if they go after the big clients. They need to start doing smaller projects that the big companies don't want. Our niche is creating unique, complex architecture situated in landscape, uh, a more extreme landscape for now. <laughs>A lot of architect firms, they tend to build, or they want to build iconic architecture. They focus on the, the look of the building instead of how the building works, how the spaces are made. And for example, in the cities, there's a lot of iconic architecture projects and they are lined, lined next to each other. And when you walk by, a lot of those projects are projects that turn heads, but it doesn't necessarily invite interaction between people. It doesn't make interaction with nature. It doesn't really make a good environment. And a lot of, for example, a lot of high rise buildings have an iconic look, but they might, might not have good quality apartments in it. The apartments might be quite bad. So I, I think that's a part of the architecture, architectural business that I dislike. You know, that people really want to be the next firm, which is Indices or Arc Daily or all these magazines. So in that way, I'm thinking smart from the beginning because I'm doing the jobs that the big companies don't want. So that's what I mean. If you think there's too much competition in your field of architecture, then maybe you should try a different part of the architecture field. You have to choose your clients well, but what I mean is that there's quite a few great projects in that bunch of not wanted jobs. <laughs> there's quite a few really good ones. So you just have to go through them. And of course, if you don't have the connection with the client, then you don't go after it. But then sometimes you find some really good ones. Sometimes the client knows exactly what she or him wants, and then they're ready to make you work. That could take one or two weeks and then you have signed the contract with them. You have to meet them first maybe, I, at least I do, I meet them first and then I see if it's a fit and then I go home and then I send them the contract. It could also take longer, it could take a few months or if the client has some issues or, or things they need to think about first before they assign you, then you know, it could take a few months. So from two weeks to a, month, a few months. Yeah, I turned on work once in a while. It has to do with my connection with the client. So it's very important for me to meet the client first and see if we have a good connection. And sometimes the client just wants this quick fix drawing, they know what they want, they probably drew it themselves maybe. So a lot of people know what they want and then, then they're not open for new interpretations of movement, uh, lights, you know, all these things that architecture can improve in the building climate. I turn down work if the client is not a good match. If, if it's not a good fit. And that has to do with the chemistry. I usually meet the clients beforehand, before I start working, and see if we want the same, if we are a good match and have good chemistry. And I turn down work if I see that it's not a match. And that could be, you know, especially if the client wants a more quick fix solution, they, they know what they want, they want it drawn fast and cheap, uh, and they're not really open for new solutions, then uh, that doesn't really get my part of the work very inspirational. So I turn those jobs down. For example, they, a house is a very private 
uh, sphere and uh, most people know what they want in their house and how they want their house. And a residential project is very private in some sort. People have all kinds of different needs and uh, they see the home in different ways. I usually book a meeting with them and that meeting usually lasts for about you know a couple of hours three hours maybe four hours and then I bring my sketchbook and then we sit down and we talk about what the project will be and then I might draw something and you do you mean this do you mean you want you want it on, on one level do you, are you okay with different levels what's your imagination of this room, etc. and all these things. More visionary, imaginative questions to make uh, the client dream and be more open for interpreting what they wanted. I think that, you know, a color is something you choose in the end of the project. You know, you can have a really good project and make it green. Uh, that's fine, <laughs> but it's more about what they look for in the architecture. I can easily see if they are interested in something more than just functional space. Then I can also, on the other hand, I can also see if they're only interested in functional space. Then I need to ask some questions about, you know, uh, what, what are you thinking about the light and what's the atmosphere and so forth, yeah. When you're just one person in a firm, it's difficult to, to have a lot of projects at the same time. And then, of course, there are periods where, uh, you know, you have to wait. You have to wait for approval, you have to wait for the customer, you have to wait, you know, for all these things, for decisions. And then it's out of your hands. So I see my, my practice as a more broad studio. That, that's why it's called Studio Holtam, because, um, you know, I, I might not be able to take another architectural project because that requires a lot of time, but I do have time for other tasks in between, which could, which could be smaller design projects or art projects, things that I could also turn into uh, revenue or you know steady income because the, the bigger projects take more time and they cost me more time. So if I can have a stream of revenue through maybe making pottery or you know drawing taking photographs which I do I take photographs and then I sell them online and then that makes a revenue stream you find inspiration in everything right <laughs> I think a lot of people read magazines architectural magazines like the Danish architect and I also read the Norwegian Architecture M, and both of those are quite local, so I can read about the Danish building industry, you know, architectural, new architectural projects in Denmark, and then also I can read about Norwegian ones. So it gives me a quite nice overview of the more regional, local projects. And then I can also go online um, on Arc Daily and the Zine and all these platforms to look after more um, global, you know, international projects in different countries. Yeah, and I think uh, a lot of architects they travel a lot. They go on um, architectural trips to see what's been built and how it's been built and experience the architecture. So that's also quite important. Recently, I saw a Netflix series called Chef's Table, you know, it's about cooking. And that's also very inspirational because they work with color, they work with composition, and the way the 
the Michelin restaurants, they go out, find local food, find new food and new materials and this could be translated into architectural language you know going out finding new materials composing it in different ways so it's it's fun to get inspiration from other places than just architectural projects but for myself i also find inspiration in you know for example i also read art magazines where occasionally there's some something about architecture or um, spatial installations in the art magazine it makes me reflect upon architecture and art, you know, and the relationship between those two. I personally use Revit and AutoCAD, and I also use uh, 3D Max Studio for renderings. And then I use Rhino for more, you know, in Rhino you work with lines and, and surfaces, while in Revit you work with components. So with Revit, uh, Rhino you can work in a more artistic three-dimensional way, and you can, all these programs you can 3D print from. And you can also laser cut from them. Okay, Pinterest is fun. Of course, because it's very um, graphic, you can look up details, you can just type something in, use it as a Google search mode, and then you can find uh, detailing, you can find materials, you can find reference projects, and then you click on it and it sends you to the original site where you can find the rest of the drawings, the rest of the you know text about the drawing, and all those sort of things. And then you can also share it with your clients, and then you know you have communi communication going. You can also keep it private or you can share it. So I'm very big on Pinterest. Other than that, if it's for managing my own business, then I use uh, noisely.com. It's background noise. So you can, <laughs> so it's really, really good for being efficient. You go to noisely.com and then you turn on whatever background sound you want. And one of my favorite is actually when I want to get in this nature mode, you know, I put on some uh, wind and then I put on some campfire sounds and some birds. <laughs> and then it's this um, whole background sounds that make me more uh, productive. And then actually, you know, turn, of course, turn off all the distractions from about, you know, when I start the work day until at one o'clock. Some days I can't do that, of course, but I, I try not to open the email before after, before 13, before, you know, at 1 p.m. So I, um, I put on that background music, so I'm in the flow. Um, and then I also use something called Productivity, Productivity Planner. It's a manual planner that you open and you use the Pomodoro technique. The Pomodoro technique, or is called, also called the Tomato technique, is about uh, you, you put a timer for 25 minutes and then you have five minutes break. And then for each 25 minute, I like scratch out a circle in the planner. So this makes me go through the project, you know, in a very efficient way. And I, I also find the, the more important tasks and I do them first. It's very important. Yeah, yeah. It, we have so many distractions and, you know, in, the, in an office. So you really need to put yourself in a, in a zone where you're not, you know, where nobody comes in the door or your phone does not ring. And then actually it makes it easy for your client as well to know that uh, from nine to uh, 12, it's creative time. So, you know, I don't take phones or anything. And then I just, I'm creative. And then working with the projects, I mean. And then from uh, 13, I call the clients and have, you know, talk with them and all those managing stuff. You know, we work in a different way that they did back in the 1980s. Before they had computers, they drew everything by hand. Now we have computers and 
uh, the technology is, you know, advanced. So we can let the computer do a lot of the drawing, etc. So the way we work changes, but also I think that we will see more of flexible architecture and temporary architecture. Not in this way, you know, not flexible in an open, close type of way, but more what is flexible architecture? Is it a building that can last for centuries? that you can just change, you know, change the inside of? Is it something with components, uh, some, you know, flexibility in the way you manufacture or put things together? You know, there's some great projects here in Denmark where they made uh, flexible buildings that actually uh, are composed of, of all these components that you can take off and then you can reuse them. I think we will see more of that as well. I heard uh, an interview with some um, known architects, Norman Foster, for example, he uh, and Saha Hadid, they talked about uh, how architect students today, they cannot sketch. They used to be able to sketch everything and draw very precise drawings, and architect students today, they uh, don't have that, you know, skill anymore. And that's because we are learning new skills, you know, computer skills, and we're drawing in a different way, for example. So it pulls in both directions. We gain something and we lose something. You know, there's still room for those architects that wants to, uh, to make linoleums printing or uh, draw sketches by hand. There's still room for them. But on the other hand, there's also room for all those people that want to make computational architecture. So I think there's room for both. So uh, yeah, I think that especially the new generation of architects have, they need to rethink everything and do it more environmentally friendly. So I will absolutely do my part. <laughs> yeah.